All right. Hey, guys. How's it going? My name is Jamie, and I'm going to be doing the lectures this week because Christine is out of town. And um, this week is kind of cool. We're going to do... Um, we're going to go over what's called object-oriented programming, which is um, a was kind of an important paradigm shift in programming a while back, and is now is very very common. Um, but we'll we'll get into it. We'll also the theme this week is also gravitational waves and black holes, which is uh, what I work on. I'm a physicist here at Caltech. And I work for a project called LIGO. Has anybody heard of LIGO? We, we were in, had big science news recently. I don't know if anybody was paying attention. So we, LIGO is a big um, physics experiment where we're looking for gravitational waves, which are waves of gravity, you know, gravity being the force that holds us here on the Earth and holds the sun in orbit, all the planets in orbit around, all the planets in orbit around the sun. And um, that force can actually have waves, which is not uncommon. A lot of the forces have, have sort of waves that come with them. But um, this was something that was predicted by Albert Einstein, and he never thought that we would actually see them, but then we built these really big detectors, and we actually detected them. And I'll give a, the science lecture on that on Friday. But in the meantime, why don't we go ahead and start talking about um, objects? Okay. So, yes, le cars. What? It's not a typo. It's not a typo. It's just meant to be a, a play on a car company you might have heard of. But, um, so, this is just a little background story. So, Yesla makes a car called the Model C, and it's a convertible, it has four wheels, two airbags, and it can either be driven by a driver or it can have an autonomous driving mode. And so, Yesla engineers wrote a design for the Model C down on a blueprint, right? This is sort of standard thing. All right, so when you make a Yesla, you actually take the blueprint and you make a car, and then you give the car, you know, each new car that you make from the blueprint has a, like, an identifying number. So in this case, it has, like, a license plate, C111, C222, etc. So, very successful. These Yeslas make thousands of them from the same blueprint. All right. Then, a little while later, Yesla wants to modify make a new car that's very similar to the C, but is slightly different. It has some additional features. So they call it the Model M, and just like the Model C, um, except that it's not a convertible, it's got a hard top. And so it's the same design as the Model C, same blueprint, except for a couple of changes, such as it has a top. And they gave it a new feature, which is that it can have air conditioning. Since it has a top, you can, you know, cool it without the cold air escaping. Okay, and similarly, once you have the blueprint, you can make new models of, new uh, instantiations of that car from the blueprint. And so they make, you know, these get identifying numbers, M111, et cetera. Millions of these, even more successful than the Model C. All right, so, so, so far we've worked with objects that are built into Python. And at, Python is a little bit interesting because everything in Python is an object. And what an object really is, is, so you guys have talked about functions, right, and data. So those are the kind of the two primary things in, in programming. In any programming language, you have data, which is represented by some kind of, um, you know, type, like an int or a float. You guys have talked about that stuff, right? All right. And then you have functions, which act on those types. So what an object is, is that it's a way to keep data together with functions that act on that data. 
and you can keep, you can basically package them all up together so that they're, when you move the object around, the functions that go with that object, you know, move with it. So if you think of it, you know, well, yeah. So basically, it's a way to, it's a basically, a, it's a basically, think of it as an organizational technique, right? You can define all of your functions and you can define all of your data types and you can say which functions go with which data types, or you can combine them into an object where you kind of define them all together. That's sort of the idea behind an object. And um, so with the car example, with the Yesla example, um, the data would be sort of the, um, the information about the car, you know, like what's its um, license plate number, how many wheels it has, uh, how does it do, uh, can it do self-driving, um, you know, what kind of engine it has, stuff like that. And then the functions are, would be the, um, you know, the things that you can apply to a car that are unique to the car. So drive, for instance, or turn on the air conditioning. Um, then the, 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 the difference between the model M and the model C, well, we'll get to that in a second. So in Python, actually, under the hood, everything is an object. So Python is actually a very deeply what we call object-oriented programming language. So when you talk about an int in Python, an int is actually an object, which is the data of the, of the integer that's stored in, that you're storing, and also the various functions that can act on an int. And so that's true for all the different numerical types, but also um, things like lists or dictionaries, tuples. You guys, I think you guys covered all of that stuff too, right? Those are all actually objects. So they, it's the, the, when you make a list, you're actually making an object that includes the data that you're putting into the list and also the functions that can act on that list, like add a new element to the list or add two lists together, stuff like that. Um, all right. So when, when you start to really get into programming with Python and you start to like, internalize this idea of objects, You'll, you'll find yourself pretty much writing everything in objects. When you write, now when I write Python code, it's pretty much all, I write everything in terms of an object, and then, you know, at the very end, when you're going to do the stuff, you actually call on these objects to do the work for you. All right, so let's kind of go through it a little bit more. Okay, so what underlies an object the, de the sort of the definition of an object is a class. So a class, this is like the blueprint in the car example. The class is the thing that defines what, are, what is the data that's in an object and what are the functions that can be called on that data. And in, the, in, the, in, um, in this object-oriented paradigm, we call the functions, the functions have a special name, they're called methods methods of the class. I'm not really sure why we have to introduce more words to make it all confusing, but that's what it is. Um, right, so as you can see here, a class, a class is a blueprint for an object, and it specifies which methods the object supports. Method, really, method is, is synonym for function. It's just special to a class. And then which pieces of data an object contains, um, and, and it doesn't actually, but it doesn't actually create the data. Some, sometimes a class can specify data inside of it sort of inherently in the, when, you, when you specify, you know, when you specify a blueprint, you specify things like how, you know, how long, how long the car is, for instance. That's a piece of data. That could be like a float, right? And that could be baked into the blueprint or baked into the class definition itself. But then other things are given to the class when it's instantiated, which we'll talk about in a second. So a class is only a, a blueprint, while an object 
is the actual instantiation of a class. So that's like the car itself. You, the, the class is like the blueprint, and then the object is like when you take the, the blueprint and turn it into a car. And we call this an instance. The object is an instance of the class, or you instantiate the class. Um, so the type of an object is when you, when you talk about something's type, that's what you're ask, actually asking about is wh what is the class that this object comes from? So when you ask about the type of the number one, that comes from the class int. Or if you, talk, if you make a list and then you do, you know, what, ask what is the type of this, you know, you say A equals um, bracket one comma two comma three, and then you ask what A is, what's the type of A, then in that case it's going to be list, right, which is the class that it comes from. Um, right, so class is a blueprint for an object. Model, the model C design is a class, and the model N design is a class. Feel free to, I, I, I'm totally fine to take questions whenever. Just, you know, go ahead, ask away. Okay, so like I was saying, a collection, a, an object is a collection of data and the functions called methods that operate on that data. Um, yeah, so for example, in a dictionary, the object contains the data from the dictionary, and then it supports the method keys, which gives you the keys from the dictionary, or the values, which gives you the list of values, and the items, which is the, the key value, the list of key value pairs as a list of tuples. Okay, and object uh, groups contain, um, yeah, so, this is sort of all the stuff I've already said. Okay, so then the other thing that's kind of cool about classes is that they have, you can do this thing called inheritance. And so this, the difference between the, the model C and the model M car is that the model M um, kind of inherits, inherits from the model C. So if you want to design another class that has most of the same information from a different class, then you can inherit that class and then tweak it as you, as you need for your own, um, for what you're trying to do. So, um, yeah, so you can uh, reuse the class and um, reuse its data or, you know, make new data and make new, reuse the methods, more importantly, or make new methods. So, so the Model M blueprint uses the same blueprint as the Model C car, but with some small modifications. So, this, 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 Functional versus object-oriented style in programming. I mean, it's funny to think of these things in the context of, you know, history. When I first started learning programming, you kind of think that it's all um, been prescribed. But in fact, you know, the, the history of programming computers is not that old. And there's been a lot of changes in people, in the ways that people think about programming computers. And this object-oriented way of writing computer programs, that was not how it was done originally. There, was this, there, were, there wasn't such a thing as objects when people wrote the first computer code. It was like a, it was a revolution that happened. Yeah. I don't remember exactly when, but it was, it became a big thing probably um, in the 90s. Yeah, so, you know, 20, 20, 25 years ago, I would say. I'm not sure when the first idea of when a, when using objects came about. So a functional, a functional, functional programming, this, it's not, it's, and it's not as if object-oriented programming is 
the only way to do things nowadays. Um, people, there are still languages, there are still, people still write programs in a functional style that fo focus more on functions and data as separate things um, versus object-oriented programming where you make classes and class methods. But, um, but it's, it, you know, object-oriented is pretty popular now, and Python is very object-oriented. Like, like I said, everything in Python is an object. Um, yeah, you can, you, can even, you can even write functional programming in Python. You know, you can just write your program in terms of just functions and data. But um, I, find it, I find it easier to work in objects. And there, there's, some, there's, there's some things that objects are very good about um, doing that's harder to do with functional programming. And I'll try to, um, I'll try to, I'll try to give some examples of that later when we do the, maybe when we do the live coding. But um, objects can really help you keep track of things in a way that's, that's really hard to do with, um, with functional programming. Um, and to, just to give you a brief example, um, so sometimes, um, so for, take the example of a car. So when you have a car, right, the, the air conditioning, for instance, can either be on or off, right? And when you get a car just, you know, when you get a car off of the assembly line, it's in some state. Probably the air conditioning is off. And then later you might have to, somebody might turn the air conditioning on. And so if, you're, if, you're, if your object, if your car object that you're using in your program, if you're in your program, if at some point later in the program you need to know whether the air conditioning is on or off, right, because it's relevant to what's going on in the computer program, the object is really good at keeping track of the state of, of the car, right? Because it has something inside of the object that says whether or not the air conditioner is on or not. If you're doing functional programming without objects, then you have to keep that data in a separate, you know, bit of information, right? You have the data of the car, you have then you'll have to have some special separate data that says whether or not the air conditioning is on. And you'll have to keep track of that, and when you try to access the car's data later in the program, you'll have to also make sure that you have the data about whether the air conditioner is on or not. And so those are all things that you have to, you know, you'll have all these data objects that you have to pass around so that you always get, make sure you get the latest state of the car. But in object-oriented programming, because you have this one thing, which is the object that has all of this information in it, it's much easier to keep track of the state of things that change their state over the course of the program. Does that make sense? All right. Um, okay, let's keep going. Yeah, so... Previously, we've been talking about functional style, but this week we'll talk about object-oriented style. Um, right, so we'll, we'll talk about how to organize a program into um, objects and classes, how to create your own class, um, and how to use these things. Okay, so let's get into it. So. So this is basically the general form of how you create a class. So it's kind of similar. So you remember how you create a program, right? You, what's, the, what's the key word for creating a function? Sorry, I said program. What I meant was function. What's the key word you use when you're creating a function? Yes? Go ahead. What? Def. Def. Right. So in the case of a class, it's just class. And then this here, name you choose, that's the name of the class. And there's a standard 
I think you guys have talked a little bit about programming um, conventions, right? Like how much spaces to use, whether how to make names, whether they have underscores and stuff like that. Have you guys talked about that at all? Okay. Typically, like I think what was described is that um, there's no, there's really no rules about what a name for your a, a, a function or a class has to be, but there are conventions, and it's really good. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler about this, and I I'm very strongly encourage you to stick to the convention um, of the programming. And some, some, sometimes different programming languages, there's not strong conventions. There's, a pretty strong, there's pretty strong conventions in Python, and there's, in fact, a document, I think uh, Christine mentioned it, called PEP8, which basically defines what a, um, the good coding convention in Python is. The most important thing, this is sort of a tangential aside, but the most important thing is that within a computer program, you maintain the same convention. This is people who write bad computer code, and there are a lot of them, make this mistake, which is that they're not consistent within the program about you, which conventions you use, like how much you indent and how you put spaces around things and stuff like that. As long as you're um, consistent, that's a good first step. But in general, I would say stick to the, the most prevalent convention for the programming language you're using. And that just makes it much, much easier both for other people to read it, which is very important, and for you to read it later. Um, there's a, a famous computer uh, scientist said that computer programs, we think you're writing, you think you're writing a computer program for a computer to read, but that's not true. You're actually writing a computer program for other humans to read. And it's a really important thing when you think about it because the, in, in the future, you're going to have to reread your computer program. And it's really good. You'll get used to reading computer programs. And like, you know, now I can just open up a computer program, the source code, and just read through it and understand what's happening. And it makes it so much easier if the computer code is written nicely. Because it's, it's just like, you know, writing uh, English with proper grammar. And, you know, if it's not, if it's written badly and there's no punctuation and capitalization, you know, I can still read it and I can still figure out what's going on, but it's much harder. If it's written all with the proper grammar and syntax and formatting, then I can just read it like a book. And I don't ha I'm not thinking about what the, the, the style is. I'm just getting to the story. And that's, true, that's really, really true with computer programs, too. So try to be good about um, writing with a good, consistent uh, syntax or uh, style. Okay, so in Python, usually, like I say, the style for, for defining a class is, is this, what they call camel case. Have you guys ever heard of this before, this term camel case? Yes. Yes. It's, you basically capitalize the first letter of each of the words, and you squash all the words together. Yeah. No, it, it, it's different. There's different. They're both camel case. One just has a lowercase first first letter versus an uppercase first letter. But for in, in the case of um, Python class definitions, it's definitely always capitalized in this way. So. Um, and then this is an important part here, this parentheses object, right? So this, in a, in a function definition, what, remember, what, what goes after the, in, inside the parentheses? Yeah. Right, the input parameters of the function. This is different in classes. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to how you pass parameters to the class, but in the case of classes, what's inside the parentheses after the, on the, on the definition line is the, what they call the superclass, and we'll, all, we'll get to that in a minute. And this is the, this is the class that um, this class inherits from. It's like the parent, the parent class. We'll get back to that in a minute. And then you indent, 
And then, like with a function, I think, did you guys talk about um, function documentation? How to write doc strings? You guys didn't talk about that? Okay, we'll talk about that in this, in this section. Um, but this is an optional um, documentation string. And then all of the, the various, you know, all indented, you can have optional data definitions, optional initialization code, and optional methods. So, and then when you create an instance of the class, it's sort of like calling a function. So with a function, you would have a variable equals function call, right, with the parentheses. And then what would happen in the function call is that the, the function would execute and it would return some data, and then that data would be assigned to this variable. In this case, though, what you're doing is that you're instantiating the class and you're assigning it you're assigning the object of the instantiated class to this variable. So you've chosen a name for your object, and you're saying, my object is going to be this class. Does that make sense? Right, okay, so we indicate the, uh, that we're going to uh, yeah, define a function with def, and we indicate that we're going to define a class with class. Right, so here's what I was saying. So this is the descriptive name, so model C, right? That's sort of that camel case. That might be a good name for a class description for the car model C, and then you might have model M um, similarly. Um, right, so this is the Python coding convention here. Um, names with capital letters, no spaces, and capitalized subsequent words. Yeah, this is all what I was saying. Okay. So, object. In Python, object is a special word. And object is the, it's like the primitive class definition in Python. And everything in Python is ultimately an object, right? And so object is, the name obviously refers to object-oriented programming, right? And so this is basically the most primitive object from which everything else inherits. So it's the, in this case, it's the superclass. So when you make a class definition like this, object is, the, is called the superclass of name your choice, the name you choose. Or, or it's called the parent class. There's a couple of different words you can use. Um, and as we can show, you can define your own classes, which this is, a, this is a class definition, and then some other class can use this class as the parent class, right? So this is another interesting part about this object-oriented programming is that you can pass, you can reuse these blueprints in interesting ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. If the, it'll still work, it, it 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 Python Python will recognize like if you don't specify, you can actually technically you could just say class name you choose, colon. And that would still work. But it's, again, it's the coding convention. This is the sort of the standard way to do it, to be very explicit about what your, what your parent class is. And if you don't have any other special parent class, then you make your parent class be object. So whenever I make a class definition, I always put this parentheses object. Um, Right, so here's an example. Like, if, let's say that you're writing a class that you want to look and behave very similarly to a dictionary. And this is, this is actually a kind of a common thing. You have, you know, you're going to have key values. So key value pairs, like what's in a dictionary, is a really common data type in computing. 
it, it's, it's, you, it's, it's very fundamental. It's used all the time. You'll, you'll see the more you write computer programs, how important the concept of a key value pair is. And so a dictionary is a really important type in Python. And so it's frequently you might want to make a new class, a new kind of object, that looks very much like a dictionary. And so you can actually just inherit from dict. And then your new class will have all of the same methods as a dictionary, but then you can add a new method, which can do something special for what you're trying to do. And that's a, that's a, that's a thing that I, that I like to do, because, again, because dictionaries are so useful. Okay, and then like we said, a superclass is all objects have a class that they inherit from. Um, and up at the very top, everything has object because that's, a, that's the most primitive thing. And all classes event ultimately inherit from object. Um, yeah, so an, an, instance of a, an instance of a subclass yeah, this is, this is important. So an instance of a subclass is the type of the class itself, but it's also the type of the parent class in all of the classes that it inherits from. So it's a subclass of the superclass, and it's an instance of both. Um, so, yeah, you, we'll, 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 we'll kind of see this stuff. Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay. So, let's get into the data definitions and how you access the class variables. Okay. So, we can put any kind of data we want inside of a class, but there's, a, there's kind of a special way that you define data inside a class. And so, and again, like how functions inside of classes are called methods, Data inside of a class are called, you know, um, are kind of called, well, I guess they're called class variables, but anything that's inside of a class is also called an attribute. I can't remember if this was, if we, if this, in, if we say this, it should have been put in these lecture notes, but this is a pretty important. That all, any member of a class, not a member, that's, a, that's the wrong word, anything that's inside of a class is called an attribute. We'll, we'll come, I'll, 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 I'll say this more as we keep going. Okay, so putting data inside of a class, it looks very similar to how you just write a sign a variable. So you say wheels equals four, airbags equals two. Um, however, inside of the class, when you want to access that data, there's a, there's a special way to access the attributes of a class, and you use this dot notation, right? So when you, when you make a, um, when you make a, should, there should be a better example, we kind of jumped to the instantiation. Um, I should, when we get to the live coding, I'll, I'll make this a little bit clearer, but so my car would be an instance of a class object, and then dot wheels, that says, give me the wheels variable from the class my car. And so in the case of this, the Model C, where we have, you know, my car is an instance of the Model C class, then the wheels attribute will have the value four. Um, right, okay. So let's, now let's get into functions. Um, uh, yeah, so when the method is called on an object, okay, yeah, so this is a little bit, um, this is a little bit tricky. Okay. So, there's this special thing in classes called self. And self refers to the 
class object itself. Okay? And this is how you store variables inside of methods of the class. This will be, this will be much clearer when we do the live coding. So every function definition, so this, is, this just looks like a regular function definition, right? You guys remember you've got def, you've got the name of the function, you've got the parentheses with the input arguments of the function, and a colon, and then indent, and then you've got whatever code you want inside of the function. In a class, there's this funky thing where the first input argument of a class method definition is the, is the word self, is the variable self. And this is, it's kind of a weird thing that you, you would assume that maybe you wouldn't have to do this, but it's, some, it's kind of a weird idiosyncrasy of Python that you have to do this. And what that means is that when this function is called, the first argument to this function is always the class itself. And that's so that function always has access to any of the data inside of the class. And so, for instance, we have that, um, that wheels definition, right? That wheels attribute that was equal to four, and that was part of, that was part of the class. And so now we can say, oh, this is just another variable, speed equals zero, right? So when inside of this function you want to access that attribute, you want to say, what is, how many wheels do I have? What's my speed? How am I going? Then you, how fast am I going? Then you say self.wheels equals what, right? Or you can assign. You can say, I mean, you could say self.wheels equals three. That's something you could change in a method. Might not be a good one for a car while it's moving, but you know, that's what you can do. You can, this is the, this is kind of the power of the class is that you can change the, ver change the data of the class inside of the class. We'll get, we'll come back to that. Um, okay, yeah, let's keep going. Right, so every class method you define should have self as its first argument. So this is pretty important. It, don't, don't forget to put the self there, or else the, the methods won't work correctly. And every time you call a method, it should be with the dot notation. A lot of this will become clear when we do the live programming. Um, Yeah, we'll, we'll learn about, there, there are some fancier things you can do with, with classes, um, but we'll, we'll, like, these static methods, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so, again, this is a, c a convention, um, but usually functions and class methods have names that are all in lowercase separated by an underscore whereas the name of the class is this camel case thing, usually um, you have lowercase with underscore separated names for methods. Okay. Python classes also have a whole bunch of methods which are called magic methods. They're sort of special methods that all classes have because they're defined in the object class that everything inherits from, okay? And um, even so, there are even some magic methods that are not in the object class, but if you define them, then um, the class will have certain behaviors that, it's under, that will be understood. But this method, this underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, is a very special um, built-in method of classes. And most of these, these built-in magic methods have this form where they have underscore, underscore, and then the name, and then underscore, underscore. And we'll, we'll see a lot more of that. But um, this, this um, particular one, called init, is the method that's called when you initialize the class. 
So when you take a class and you want to turn it into an object, this is the method that's called. And again, you see it's got the self as the first argument, and then you've got any additional parameters, input parameters, to the um, to when you instantiate the object. Um, and this is automatically called whenever you initiate instantiate an object. Um, um, so if you yeah if you want to do anything you can define what goes on in this. If you don't want your class to do anything special at, at when you initialize it, you don't have to define this. But if you do, then you can do special stuff. So here's an example. So um, this, is a, this is a very trivial example of an init function. It doesn't actually do anything except it just prints out the string, I'm initializing an object doesn't do anything special to the class. And so you can see that the init function method has no special input parameters and it doesn't really do anything. So the init method for the model C class, for instance, could have something like this. You say def init self, then you give it a license plate number, right? And then there are two things that happen here. One is that it immediately instantiates a variable of the class that says has top, right? So it's like, does this thing have a top? And so you say, we're going to put that to be false, just to say up front that this, this object has no top. And then the license plate, self.license plate, equals license plate. So this is this these two things are the same, so it's basically assigning to self.license plate whatever you've passed in at, at, in the license plate input parameter. Yeah? Uh, so basically, you call it, so actually, I'm going to the first one, but so are those this little dot things where you pass options to the object, or? Yes, but you mean like this, like this thing so equals that? Like Okay. Uh, but that's not really normal. Usually you just write uh, what the variable is defined as. Well, in, no, but in the case, in the example that you just used, the variable is being defined to be the string hashtag whatever. And that string for color, that's a color definition, typically. I mean, that, that, this is a, that's, a, that's a kind of a funky example. But colors, there's different ways you can... When you're talking about colors, there are different ways you can um, express colors, right? You can express them as tuples of numbers. You can express them as a string. And so in the particular example that you're using, you're saying, you know, my color equals hashtag 5555, five, 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 whatever. That's assigning the string to the variable my color. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the name of the variable, this is true in any programming language. You, the names of the variables can be whatever you want, right? This, yeah, it can be whatever you want. This is, this is, this, um, oops. This variable has top, right? We just picked that, picked that name. We could have just done self.a equals false. Oh, you mean you mean like th like this? Yeah, but not even like that. It's like there's these functions that in their calling they have they have a color equal something. Oh, I think I know what you're talking. You're talking about keyword parameters in functions. Yeah. Yes. We the, okay. That's a special way of um when we get to the live coding. Ask me that again. Okay, and I'll show and I'll show you give you some examples of I, I understand what you're asking now. The other question is are the options for the class when it's called inside of the uh, init? Yes. So yes. basically like you can put all the things you need and then whatever you pass to the object will just go to the init. Exactly.
Exactly. Exactly. That, that's exactly right. So when you, th these, the, when you, uh, I wish I could, I, maybe for the next lecture I'll figure out how to flip back and forth between, actually maybe I can do it. Let's see if I can, let's see if we can sort of live code this as we go. Um, okay, IPython. I3, wow, that's uh, very impressive that you knew exactly what I was, my window manager. Where did, does it say that somewhere? Or did you just guess that? No, no, well, I, 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 know, I know there was a time on PWM. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have you guys, so you guys have seen IPython before, right? Okay. So, um, wait, what was I? Yeah, it's a good one. So, um, what was I going to show? What were we talking about? We were talking about the instantiating a class, right? So l let's say a uh, class, uh, class foo. Can you guys read this? It's a little bit. It's a little bit small. I don't even. I'm not sure if I can even figure out how to. Oh, I know what I'll do. Here. Uh, a Python notebook. All right, this will be easier. Um, new Python 3. Okay, that's easier to see, right? Yeah. Class foo object Okay, so def init self um, var zero. Okay, uh, self dot var zero equals var zero. Okay. So do you, guys, do you guys see what do you guys see what I did here? So I just defined a class foo inherits from object, and I defined this instantiation method called init. And all that this does is it says that there's going to be one input parameter for my class, and I'm just going to assign it like this. Okay, so now if I try to do um, foo equals foo like that, what's going to happen? There's going to be an exception. So type error, right? It says, oh, when I try to instantiate, here, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to instantiate the class foo and assign the object that's generated from that instantiation to the variable foo lowercase, okay? But when it did, when I tried to do that, it says, oh, you know what? Your init, your, your missing, your init method says that there's going to be a parameter, var zero, but you didn't provide one, so you're missing, you're missing positional argument. This is the same thing that happens when you define a function that you've defined to have an input parameter, and you don't provide that input parameter, you get the same, you get the same error. So now, let's say, let's go back up here and say uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, A, S, D, F. Okay, now, now we're cool, right? Because we gave it that input parameter. So now that we have this object, foo, right? What can we do? We can say foo dot var zero. And that will print out the, the, the value of that variable in the class. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. Okay. Let's, yes. Yes, you can. You can do, so let's, yes, that's a good question. Um, 
and it, we're, I'll actually talk about this in a couple of slides. This, um, uh, so I can say um, blah equals 10, right? Okay, so now I'll make, do this again. Again, that. And now what happens if I do, oops, foo dot blah. Nothing. Attribute error. I don't know what blah is. And that's because this variable, blah, is localized to just inside this function. And so that variable only exists when, while that function is executing. Once that function is done executing, that variable goes away. So that's, this is an important thing to remember. So if you want your variable, your inside of a class, to be persistent, to, to always be there, then you assign it to self like this. This is really, this is really important, okay? This is kind of, in some sense, the most important thing about classes. The fact that you can, inside of a function, make a variable that will persist once that function is done executing. That, you can't do that with regular functions, right? But you can do that with functions inside of classes. So that's what makes classes really powerful, that you can do exactly this. Yes? You can. There, there's, a, there's a way you can do that, too. Um, it's... it's, it's um, you, technically, you can't, actually, in Python, because um, you can always, you can kind of always modify things. This is, this is something that, um, that people, some people don't like about Python, but some people do. It, Python is flexible this way, um, and so sometimes it's, you know, it's mostly by convention. But you can also do something like this. Um, Quux equals... Uh, so this, this is another way... So this variable that I defined here, the self is kind of implied, right? Because it's, it's sort of at the same level it's, in, it's basically right inside the class definition. So this is another way to make a variable inside of foo. And this is also, except, um, this is also uh, accessible. Um, and, but you can modify it. So, Let's see what happens if you do uh, quux equals 9999. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, actually, that's good. So, oh, no, wait. No, I did it wrong. Yeah, sorry. This should be self.quux. Well, from, from where? From the init. What I mean is you print it in Quox before you define this Quox, not self Quox. Right. So, meaning you want, you want this, you want like this. Yeah. Like that? Yeah, exactly. I'm wondering... Uh, right, no, I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable question. And you'll see... that this variable quux doesn't exist within the namespace of the function. It exists in the namespace of the class, but not of the function. But in order to access it in the class, you have to have self. So, right. This is all, this is all good stuff.
to try within your IPython notebook or just within IPython. It's a great way to learn about programming. Just try stuff, see what happens. Um, okay. So we're almost done with the hour. Uh, oh, man. Jump me way back. Went way back into the lecture. Okay. Where were we? Okay. Now, um, right, okay. Then, now let's look at the init method for the model M class. Remember, the model M class is one that's going to inherit from the model C class. So, there's a special thing that you can do in subclasses which is to say, I want to initialize this class the same way that I would initialize the Model C class object, but then I want to change something. So, there's this funny syntax, and again, this is just something, just something you have to learn for Python. There's not a good, there's not a good intuitive way to think about this is this function called super, and this says, give me the super class of my class and execute its init function with these variables. Yeah? That reminds me of uh, what you might do when reclining shell variables in a uh, lot of, uh, in like most cells, you actually mm -hmm. put the shell variables And then add other things. Right, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of similar, although you can do the same thing, you can do the same thing in Python. I mean, that's not too different about how in Python you can do plus equals, like variable plus equals two. You know, if you if I define a variable, you know, x equals two, and I say x plus equals four, then x will equal six. So Anyway, but yeah, the point is here is that you can, you can, um, you can say instantiate this. The first thing I do when I instantiate this is instantiate my superclass. So do the same thing that I would do in my superclass, which is all of the same stuff. So basically, this call right here does exactly this. Right, because this is the this is the init method for the model C, and then so it's going to say has top equals false, and then license plate equals license plate, and so after this thing has been called right here, these things are true. These things have been done. Then, because I'm making a model M instead of a model C, the I'm going to change the has top variable to be equal to true instead of false. Right, because my, my model M has a top. Yeah. Um, okay. It's actually more like adding things to a it's not adding them for it. Then like you base for like for for example, the path variable has mm -hmm. uh, a list of all the places it looks for programs, like class bin, class bin. Right. It's a, it's it's similar right. It's similar in concept to that. But again, in, in, in Python you can have a list and you can add elements to the list. But this is a little bit different because in this case we're, we're actually modifying the con we're, we're, this is an executing of a function. I mean, it's a sort of similar that you're taking an object and you're modifying it uh, in some way. And, um, but this is, this is a way to specifically get access to the superclass functions. And so this is, you can do this with the init, and this is a very common way to have your init method get instantiated as if it was part of the superclass, but you can do this with any method in, in Python. So you can, you can define the method blah, and then you can do super paren paren dot blah, and so that would basically execute the, um, the 
blah method of the superclass. And the point is, is that what this, what this funky thing does is that it, it changes the, um, the properties of this class, of self. So that's the important thing to remember. All right, so that, it's 9 o'clock now, and so I guess we're good for this lecture. Um, and then we'll pick up on this again at 1, 2, 1, 1. Um, if, if there are any other questions, I'm, I'm, I'll hang around for a little while, and I might hang around through the, um, through the lab also. But feel free to ask me, you guys, any questions you want. Nothing. It's the primitive. It's the primitive definition. Yeah. See. Yeah.